In this video, I wanted to talk about break-in periods for pistols. Now, here's the thing. Um, this is going to be a discussion video. This is a desktop video. This is just something I thought of spur of the moment. So, really, there's not going to be much of a presentation or anything like that. I haven't prepared anything, so you're going to be staring at a gun listening to my hideous, hideous voice. So, anyways, um, first thing first, I want to talk about, you know, why it's necessary. And, basically, uh, we'll move on from there. So, Here's the thing, you gotta, in order to understand why it's necessary uh, for not just 1911s, mostly for 1911s, um, but also any other pistol for the most part, I like to call it an amnesty period more than anything, but it, but with all that said, um, for 1911s specifically, uh, it is needed, but the reason why pistols do need a break-in or amnesty period in case there's anything wrong with it or expecting malfunctions is... Uh, certain things. Number one is tolerances. So here's the thing. Um, when they're making these pistols, there's tolerances, which means that it's going to be of a certain measurement. And uh, take this dry and erase marker, for instance. The diameter of this cap can be, you know, what is it, like a quarter inch or a half inch, plus or minus like two thousandths of an inch or whatever. That's pretty tight tolerances. So here here's the thing, that's where your tight tolerances comes in, because when you're manufacturing this and you measure them, if it comes in over uh, that specification or under that specification, because you got leeway by two thousandths of an inch either way, smaller or bigger, um, then it's going to be a throwaway part. That's tight tolerances. That's not the same as fitting. People screw that up all the time. It's just a lack of education and ignorance. But uh, it kind of you know, it's kind of like the difference between clip and magazine. So people that bitch about people that say clip instead of magazine, if you're saying tolerances instead of fitting, you're doing the same thing. But anyways, uh, with all that said, <clears throat> uh, the tolerances of these pistols are based off of, uh, some of the times, from what I found out, that it's based off of pre-finish uh, dimensions. So if this is supposed to be a tight-fitting 1911, it was designed to be tight-fitting and measured out before the finish, uh, it's going to be even tighter, and therefore a lot of the designs, they're designed around that initial tight-fitting, so the recoil spring tension is designed around that, uh, and it's expected that it's going to machine itself to perfection. So that's one thing that uh, you're going to get some mm, problems with that at first, you could, anyways. And so this finish can also cause additional friction that they did not anticipate or that just can't be planned for. And here's the thing, when you have something that is um, basically lower in the tolerance range and higher in the tolerance range, like it's bigger or in the other one smaller or both of them are oversized, that can cause additional friction, right? That's just how it works. Perfection is kind of hard. But anyways, with that said, uh, fitting tolerances, that can cause some issues at first. It, it just happens. So there's not really too much of a way to get around that. Uh, also, spring tension can be an issue as well. So if you're having uh, some additional friction here um, and you have like a heavy recoil spring, that can cause short shucking of the, uh, of the slide. So you're basically causing malfunctions, issues with ejection, maybe issues with feeding. Um, if you're having issues with feeding, it can either be an overpowered uh, recoil spring to where it's so strong that it's uh, basically not letting the magazine uh, feed the round up in time, or maybe it's an issue with the feed ramp. Depends on the kind of failure to feed. And then, you know, based on the kind of issues you're having with the 1911, which you could have endless amounts of issues, uh, basically any issue that you can think of, a 1911 can have under the right circumstances, but spring tension can be a big factor. Extractor spring tension, usually I find them to be low in tension. Uh, if it's higher in tension, yes, you can add the same issues. It'll uh, cause failures to eject and stuff like that. Uh, typically, you'll have failures to extract if it's too loose because it won't hold onto the rim and try to pull it out of the chamber. So. Those are things to consider. Uh, good spring tension on the 1911, if it's too heavy at first and the fitting is too tight, it can you know, cause issues with cycling uh, until, obviously, the spring tension goes down or whatever. Uh, so 
basically you're going to have three springs that you're going to need to have uh, basically in harmony when you make these pistols. An extractor tension, recoil spring tension, and magazine spring tension for the most part. So there's others too, but uh, not really as important as these key three. So obviously the extractor is going to extract and help eject, and the recoil spring is going to help with this whole cycling and help everything uh, do its thing. The magazine spring, if it doesn't actually keep up with it, or if it's too loose and it doesn't have the tension to push the round up in the right time, then you're not going to get a round fed or fed properly or whatever. You're going to get a you know, failure to feed properly. So, anyways, um, <clears throat> here's the thing. When firing the, the gun, you're going to get a lot of torque in one direction because the rifle is, uh, the, the barrel is rifled. Uh, it's rifled in one direction and it's going to have opposite torque. So you'll notice that there's wear in one side over the other. So here's the thing. For you guys that like to polish guns and you want to polish both sides, you're just loosening up the fitting. And uh, sometimes that can actually work against you and you can cause unnecessary amounts of wear because whenever you're polishing, you're taking the surface off. And that little bit it can cause uh, basically uneven wear or it can cause wear in areas that it should not and it can cause weakening in certain areas. So when you're firing a gun, you will actually notice a unique wear pattern in every gun. Not every gun is going to wear exactly the same. So that's, that's one of the things that it why it's important to actually shoot your gun and not just start polishing it. However, there are some areas that I would polish on, like, say, a 1911 or something that's having issues. That would be the inside and the feed ramp, uh, the inside of the chamber, that is. So <clears throat> that can um, be an issue if the manufacturer has uh, kind of lower specs on the size of the uh, chamber. Um, but, you know, I would have a gunsmith do that or somebody that else that can be held responsible for anything that goes bad. But that's just my personal opinion there. Uh, so, yes, it's very important that you actually fire the gun and uh, kind of give it a chance uh, to try to work itself out. But there's this is also moving us on to technique uh, of basically breaking in or starting to notice uh, issues or getting the thing worked into where it needs to be and starting the wear pattern so it fires smoothly. First thing is dry fire. Rack this pistol a lot with snap caps uh, you know, and uh, dry fire it a lot. And use, use snap caps when you dry fire, protect the firing pin and stuff like that because that's typically how people will break firing pins. Uh, if you shoot like one round a year, you dry fire for five minutes, you know, every month, then you're probably not going to break a firing pin anytime soon. But uh, I've broken plenty of firing pins because I'll fire thousands of repetitions uh, through these things, and good snap caps will always uh, protect it. So snap caps like these A zooms right here, you see they have a piece of rubber on where the firing pin hits, and it will even indent. You'll want to replace them. But the one thing you'll notice is that there is metal on, this is all made of metal, and metal on metal on the extractor can actually be a good thing, because the finish on this uh, pistol is actually quite abrasive, and it can kind of catch on the brass a little bit. Uh, so this kind of stuff actually helps wear the finish off of the uh, extractor, so it just makes the hook a little bit deeper by thousands of an inch, but that, that can only help you, in my opinion. So anyways... Also, one of the things that you can do is do a nice deep cleaning on the gun, basically tearing it apart and basically completely disassembling it, which actually would not be a bad video to do on this pistol. So, anyways, as far as the dry section goes, that's what I would do. I would uh, dry fire it, and I would have the thing completely dry. It'd start out the friction, rack it really hard, do your malfunction do drills, do your reload drills, and all that stuff, and I emphasize drill, not courses of fire, like practicing, you know, a course of fire like the one to five, talk, I'm talking about drills, things that you can do over and over that'll be habitual, malfunctions, reloads, uh, draws, uh, stuff like that, <clears throat> uh, aligning your target, uh, going from finger off the trigger to uh, pulling the trigger completely without moving the gun, <clears throat> uh, stuff like that, work with your gun, and rack it a lot, and, uh, you know, work with the slide release, work with, uh, power stroking and stuff like that because the other thing that you're going to want to do in order to break in the pistol is uh, kind of polish the um, sympathetically polish the feed ramp a little bit or not the feed ramp the mag the basically these the mag well so the little funneling inside here 
get a, <clears throat> a little bit, uh, I guess, worn and get it nicely polished with the magazines you intend to use, which for me, Wilson Combats are really the only good magazines for this 1911, unfortunately, so I basically have to pay a pretty penny to keep this thing functioning, which sucks. But anyways, um, it's a labor of love, I suppose. So, yes, yes, just keep running. So, <clears throat> with all that said, um, when you do go out to the range and you're done dry firing, I recommend 90% dry fire and then 10% uh, on the range. Basically, treat the range as verification. And when you're breaking in the pistol, my recommendation is to shoot fast. With heat and with, with a lot of friction, which is shooting fast and the bullets going off, you're going to create heat. And this is going to work on the spring. So when you already have a heat-treated spring, and you heat them up more, you're going to cause changes a lot faster. And also, when you heat up the finish, they wear a lot faster. And that's why a lot of times they'll tell you, you know, the more you shoot your gun, the more you're going to wear it out faster. And here's the thing. For the breaking period, you want heat. You want friction. You want, you want all that good stuff. You want to shoot your gun fast, or you are going to have a lot of malfunctions throughout that time. Get them, uh, get them hot. Get them running. So... That's also a good thing if you grease your gun. You want it to get hot so the grease actually kind of becomes like water and flows into the area it needs to go. So the other thing is do not, during your firing section, do not have uh, too much lube. Do not lube it too intensely. Do not, you know, wipe it dry, but do not lube it too intensely. Get the rail channels here a little bit because you don't want the rail channels to start chipping away because if it's too dry and the finish is kind of thin, kind of like this one, uh, it can actually cause a little bit of chipping on the metal finish, which may not be a bad thing, but you don't really want to rub these things raw and get a lot of heat behind it right away, especially around this bushing area. You want to keep that nice and lubricated because you don't want to see changes in that. You don't want to see too much wear in the bushing and the, and the barrel. That's where your accuracy comes in, and also these locking lugs. Um, I, I recommend lubricating them because that's one of the heaviest wearing points on the 1911 and for most pistols. So keep that area nice and lubed to keep the uh, area on the barrel nice and lubed for the accuracy. So uh, with that, I, I would actually say that you can kind of get away with a light lubrication or no lubrication once you start wearing it. Um, I usually stick with a light lubrication, but uh, you can do what you wish with that. Uh, after you basically break in the pistol. So, um, anyways, here's here's the other thing. Uh, basically, to kind of simplify everything, I I do about two thousand rounds for full size pistols and about thousand rounds for uh, compacts or and five hundred rounds for like micro guns. And the reason is because of the pressures and the intensity of the recoil and the cycling uh, for each of those sizes. So, for a uh, for the full-size pistols, they're not really uh, taking on too much of extraneous forces. Uh, the smaller pistols, they're getting a lot more boom, and they're uh, taking a lot, uh, and they're going to hit a lot harder on themselves. They're going to break themselves a lot easier. Uh, so the micro guns, I mean, those these little simple machines that we're trusting to not go boom in our hands, uh, those are going to have a lot more pressure. You can tell by the recoil for the most part. So uh, it's not going to take as long to kind of break them in because they're already beating themselves to death already. So things like your Keltec PF9s, your cars, your uh, your Glock 43s, your uh, Sig 365s, which um, I actually have a pretty good opinion of if Sig can uh, you know uh, fix their uh, fix some of their issues in their quality control, it wouldn't be a bad pistol. But it's not really revolutionary, as I've said in my video. But uh, they're just basically doing what other manufacturers are scared to do, which is basically take away some dimensions in certain areas. But anyways, so uh, that's basically it for the break-in, just to kind of keep it short and simple. I put, a, I, I put a little bit too much engineering and science behind this, and, uh, you know, it's also coupled with a lot of experience with pistols. But, uh, you know, it's not too hard to figure these things out. I'm going to be doing more videos on the 1911 as far as, like, tension, uh, disassembly, and stuff like that, uh, recommendations on how to keep them functioning, uh, but um, no, in no way am I any nearly as good as somebody like Larry Vickers, Bill Wilson, or anything like that. Uh, I'm not as knowledgeable as them, however, uh, I would like to add, you know, my experience to the mix, and it, it's something that I've actually uh, seen 
um, kind of echoed throughout the uh, highly experienced community, so that's uh, pretty good, so I have no problem kind of spreading this. So, anyways, if you guys have recommendations on how to break in pistols, uh, you know, we're not really worried about accuracy, we're worried about functionality at first, most pistols. Um, unless they are smooth bore, are going to be more accurate than you're able to. So most of your issues are going to be from um, inability to properly align the sights, or you know, most of the part it's going to be a failure to pull the trigger without moving the gun. So that's why I'm not touching on accuracy, except for you know lubing this so you don't start affecting it because the bushing and the lock up here is going to be a big contributor to that. So anyways, uh, if you have any recommendations on uh, it, like anything I might have missed, uh, then uh, go and leave it in the comments below. If you don't believe in breaking, then I'm sure I'm going to get a thumbs down and a negative comment about that, but uh, uh, I've had too much experience not to believe in it. Uh, and I've seen too much to not, and at least you can believe in an amnesty period where you can uh, shoot the pistol to death and for the first thousand rounds uh, to see if anything breaks, because typically things are going to break for full-size pistols, 2,000 rounds. And for, you know, compacts, 1,000, and then, uh, you know, 500 rounds for micro guns. So, anyways, if there's going to be uh, something that's mismanufactured, a metal uh, spring that's not heat-treated properly or is going to break prematurely, that's when it's typically going to break on the different sizes. So, anyways, I appreciate you guys watching this. Go ahead and leave a comment below, like this video, subscribe, and share. So, thanks a lot for watching. You guys have a good one.